Hello and welcome to another episode of Ask Your Representative, the show where voters post questions to their elected officials. I'm Trevor Wynn, the business and marketing librarian at the Clarkston Independence District Library. This is a special edition of Ask Your Rep today because we're focusing solely on the issues raised by Clarkston area students. Today we're pleased to welcome Michigan State Senator Rosemary Bayer. Senator Bayer, a Democrat from Beverly Hills, was elected in November 2018 to represent Michigan Senate District 12 which covers most of North Oakland County, Annex and South, through Pontiac, Auburn Hills, and Southfield Township. Prior to her election to the Michigan Legislature, Senator Bayer worked for over 20 years in the technology sector, working 15 of those years as a systems engineer and global unit leader for Sun Microsystems. She also founded Ardent Cause, a database technology company serving nonprofit organizations. Hello, Senator Bayer. Welcome to Independent Television in Clarkston. Thank you, Trevor. We're really happy uh, that you could spend some time with us today to answer questions from students. Thank you. I'm excited. Awesome. So we've got a lot of great questions, so we're just going to dive right in. Um, our first question comes from Annalise, and she's a student at Everest Academy. And she's curious how familiar legislators need to be with the Constitution to their job. And she's also curious about, you know, the day-to-day -day life for um, an elected official in Lansing. What's that like for you? Those are very different questions. <laughs> Well, okay, so let's start with the uh, familiarity with the Constitution. Um, so I came to this job from nowhere near this job. I'm, I'm a software engineer. I'm uh, not very familiar with politics mm -hmm. and uh, know about uh, much about the Constitution as most people do, mm -hmm. which is really not that much. So one of the things that you learn in this work is you look things up. You have a team of people who are amazing. So whenever we have a new issue, we have something going on, we have research. We have people on our staff that do the research, that help out with collecting information, mm -hmm. because it's an awful lot of stuff to keep up with. Sure. So I'm lucky in that I have a really, really strong staff in Lansing. It's been great. Um, so the second question was... The second question was really what it is like for you day to day. What's an average day in the life of a state senator? You know, are, are you going to meetings? Are you meeting with legislators? You know, how much time do you spend maybe in the chamber, which is okay. where you vote, but that's sure. what we see a lot on TV. Yeah, but that's and, and probably not where you spend question. most of your time. That is a really good question because the days are varied. There's two, there's really two kinds of days. One is the days where we're in Lansing. Mm -hmm. So every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're in Lansing and we have session from 10 to when we're done. Usually it's around 12. There have been mm -hmm. days that go a lot longer. And so when we're on the Senate floor in session, sometimes you can watch, you can always watch it on TV sure. and it looks like we're not doing things. <laughs> so a lot of times it looks like we're not doing things. Sometimes there's a bunch of votes and mm -hmm. votes will happen really fast. Okay. And, but then there's all this little conversational thing that go on mm -hmm. during the day. You'll see people get up and wander across the aisle. You'll see a whole group of people go to caucus in a private room off mm -hmm. to the side and all of a sudden the room's empty. So that goes on usually a couple hours, sometimes longer. The rest of the time, it's um, committee meetings. So we're all, we all have, all senators, all House of Representatives members have committees that they're part of. Mm -hmm. And so we have committee meetings, sometimes before session, sometimes after session. We have meetings with people in the industry, people who are experts in their fields. So one of the things we're trying to work on right now, for example, is um, solar schools. Mm -hmm. Trying to do some pilots, get some schools to put solar power on their roof, oh. generate electricity for sure. themselves, sell it back into the grid, make a little money. Wow. Good stuff for schools. Clarkston might want to do that. Sure. We'll have to talk to the superintendent about that. We are. And as a librarian, <laughs> I love to hear um, that research is so much a part of your job because it's, it really is so important and there's so much information out there. So I'm glad to see that you're all So do you want me this. to tell you about the other kind of days that Sure, we have? absolutely. So those three days a week are in Lansing. Okay. And then there's the other four days a week where mm -hmm. we're in the district. And in the district means coming here. Sure. So today, for example, we're in Clarkston from this point in time mm -hmm. until about 8.30 tonight. And so that's a pretty long day, sure. but we have a whole series of meetings with different groups of people. We're here at school for a few things, and then we've got a meeting with some advocates, and mm -hmm. then we've got office hours, coffee hour, yep. to opportunities for people who live here, who live nearby, to come and meet, mm -hmm. because it's a big district. And so we're in Clarkston today, maybe tomorrow we're in Beverly Hills, and then we're in Auburn Hills or Pontiac, and we just sort of move around the district on any given day and spend our time with the people. And when it's nice out, we go knock on doors and say okay. hello. How are you? Want to introduce myself? Here's my phone number. So if I was a constituent and maybe I just learned that 
um, that I can come and talk to you? Is that something that I can check on your website on a regular basis? Because, I mean, yes. they come to the library all kinds all the time, so I'm aware of it, but I'm not sure it's as, Everybody it's else as well does. known yeah. as... That's a really good point. Thanks for that. Um, so the library, I mean, the, the meetings, usually the coffee hours are at the library here. You can always see what we're doing on senatorbayer.com. Okay. So we'll, when you're, for, for example, we were in Lake Orion last week. So okay. when, that's pretty close by for a lot of people. And sure. People in Clarkston live on right near sure. the edge of that. So Clarks, we go to Lake Orion, Oxford, Auburn Hills, you know, whatever uh, is easiest for people to get to. It's on the website, senatorbayer.com. Excellent. Excellent. That's good info. All right, so our next question is from Allison. Um, she's a student at the Clarkson High School where we're at right now, and she has a question about school funding. Hi, I'm Allison Osborne, and I'm a senior from Clarkson High School. My question for you is, seeing that Clarkson Community Schools is one of the lowest funded districts in Oakland County, do you think the school funding formula should be revisited? I do, I absolutely do. One of my long-term goals. So when I was campaigning and moving around the district, knocking doors, talking to people, asking them about schools, because mm -hmm. it's really important to me that we do a better job with our public education. I asked how people felt about the funding mm -hmm. and I never found a single person. And I talked to hundreds of parents, teachers, administrators, not a single person who thought it worked. Wow. So nobody is happy with the model we have. And then I also talked to people in the villages, in the townships, mm -hmm. in the cities. Do they think it works? And they don't like it either. I mean, it really doesn't work for anybody. So one of our long-term goals is to revisit that in a big way, really restructure how we get the funding for schools. Mm -hmm. So completely replace Proposal A, come up with a new kind of system. Because we know it's not working. And we know that the schools are not getting enough money. So. Are there so any ideas doesn't. that you've heard to replace, you know, Prop A? Because, I mean, property tax has been kind of the way it's been for so long, and that must be a You huge know, there hurdle. are other ways. There are schools, when you look across the country, there are places where they have had a system that's similar to ours, mm -hmm. and now they've moved away from it. So there are other options. One of the challenges is what we do with the money once we collect it. Part of it is we don't have enough money. That's sure. the first problem. The second problem is once we do collect the money, how do we allocate it back out? And how do we make sure that we do that equitably so that each school district has what they actually need, right, in a fair way? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that everybody gets the same amount of money. It means that you get what's needed sure. based on the students you have. So I think that's, we have to put those two things together and come up with a model that actually works for Michigan kids. So our next question comes from Gage, and I think he has a question that's going to be right up uh, the Senator's alley because he has a question about the big tech industry um, and social media companies. Senator Bayer, my name is Gage and I'm a senior at Everest Collegiate High School in Clarkston. We're studying the history of antitrust legislation in government and economics this semester. Many of the early monopoly cases were initiated at the state level. Do you see a role for the Michigan legislature in an emerging discussion about big tech or certain social media giants? <laughs> Probably, right? I, I think what's happening now, uh, you know, it has to do with the way our federal government is focused. Mm -hmm. So there is, um, you know, I think a lot of states and uh, state attorney generals are hoping to have the federal government take a stronger position against mm -hmm. the monopolies that are happening. Um, they're not. And so the attorneys general are kind of ganging up together mm -hmm. and sort of uh, moving forward uh, in Facebook and Google and some of the other big companies to try to make it happen at the state level. So I think it's inevitable. Um, we have a really strong attorney general now mm -hmm. who is pretty fearless when it comes to taking on big problems. So I think we're I think we have a good chance of uh, stepping into that and try to to help adjust the way things are working. So what's your view more generally about uh, the role that social media companies play in, for example, um, how news is digested? Because as we know, I mean, so many Americans, you know, get their news from social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or wherever. Um, I mean, how do you think that's impacted the political discussion? And do you think that they should be treated differently because that's how Americans and Michiganders um, use their platforms? Do I think the companies should be treated differently? Sure. So instead of just a tech company, that has news and then um, kind of publishes everything without a lot of e oversight. No exactly. So, I mean, if we know that Americans are getting their news from a social media company, is it their responsibility to ensure, as a journalist would, that the information they're putting out is accurate? 
Yeah, I mean, the problem we have is the First Amendment. Sure. Um, and I don't think anybody wants to clamp down on, we don't want to be China, right? Mm. We don't want the U.S. to control everything that happens on the Internet. I don't think anybody wants to go there. So that means there will always be things available that are mm -hmm. not true, right? There's always going to be information that is incorrect for various reasons, and we need to find a way to uh, help people find the truth. Actually, it's interesting because uh, in talking to the librarian, Trevor, uh, one of my suggestions in going around on campaign talking about this mm -hmm. was to have uh, libraries be the source of truth, to have a new role for libraries where people can actually just check. We sure. used to do this when I was a kid. People would call the library and ask a question. Sure. This would be similar to that. If there was a way to have a source of truth, um, who do you trust? You trust your librarian. Well, I, but we do have to do I love that you said that, and I, um, <laughs> I hope um, that you're also happy to hear that this is something that uh, the people in the community, they still do this all the time. So I'm working in the library, we get questions about things, you know, whether it's students or adults or training, so that definitely still happens, and the library still is one of those places, so I yeah. just want to plug so for I don't my think employer. we've solved the problem <laughs> at all, but, and we have a ways to go. We have to Excellent. come up with something, and I don't know that we have the solution. But libraries seem like a good, good place to start. I love it. It's true. Um, all right, so our next question comes from Nathan, and Nathan is a student at the Clarkston Junior High, and he has a question about climate change. My name is Nathan. Um, I'm from Clarkston High School with Teen Lead uh, at the Clarkston Library, and my question to Senator Bayer is um, what are some of the things that the legislator can do to address uh, climate change in Michigan? Well, there's things we can do. I mean, once again, it would be great to have some more support from the federal government, but mm. in, uh, in the, until we get to that point, there are things we can do locally, um, and it's about holding companies accountable, right? There's, a, there's about making people more aware of what they can do and making companies more aware of what they can do. So, um, for example, we, uh, we just passed some legislation, actually, on okay. um, air quality fees and how mm -hmm. to structure that um, because it's really important that we continue to reduce the, the gunk that we spew into the atmosphere, right? So um, the, the, every time a utility company reduces its emissions mm -hmm. into the air, they, their bill goes down. So it's an incentive for them sure. to do better, right? We want to incent them to do clean energy. We want to make it easier for Clarkston schools to have solar panels on their roof so they can generate their own electricity, right? So it's clean, green, and it's better for Clarkson schools, right? So we want to do everything we can to encourage new energy, but different ways of doing energy. Um, we also have, you know, we have to do the same thing with the ground, right? We have to protect mm. what's happening with uh, the surface water, the groundwater, the uh, pollutants that we're burying. Um, one of the challenges now, if you're all familiar with the PFAS mm -hmm. issue, uh, we can filter that out of the water, but so far we haven't been able to get rid of it. So once you have it filtered, you have mm -hmm. this container of really bad stuff, and the current method of dealing with that is to bury it. Mm. Now it's Kind of the opposite of what we wanted. Not exactly what we want. <laughs> Putting it back where yeah. it came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll put it in really big concrete blocks sure. and put it underground. Not a good strategy. Right. So, um, so anyway, there's a lot of different areas where we have to continue to look at um, the environment as a whole, climate change in particular, you know, people individually can also do their part, right? Reduce your consumption. That's Absolutely. the number one step. Quit buying stuff, quit buying stuff with packaging on it. You know, yeah. anything you can do to, to reduce the load on the environment. Every time we have all this plastic that has to be dealt with, then there's some kind of output from that mm -hmm. that is bad. And the generation of plastic is, requires oil. Right. So, we don't want oil. I mean, all those, the fossil fuels are bad. All those things kind of work together. So people can change their behavior. Companies can change their behavior. People can pressure companies to change in how they buy things. And we've seen that happen a lot um, as of late. And I mean, I, know I would put solar panels on my house if I could afford it. I would love that. It's natural. Right. And I could put some back in the grid we and need make, to make, it easier make a little for money. Everyone. Of Absolutely. Course. All right, um, our next question comes from Fernando. Um, he's also a student at Everest Academy, and he has a question about the talent gap right here in Michigan. Senator Bayer, my name is Fernando, and I'm a senior at Everest Collegiate High School. There seems to have been a lot of reporting on the talent gap in Michigan this year with top companies struggling to fill high-value jobs with Michigan talent. 
Is this an education challenge? My high school math teacher is an engineer with very interesting real world experience. I feel like I understand where my academic work is leading for college and beyond. Are there any legislative priorities on the radar to address the Michigan talent gap? Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen some of the issues with openings in big companies that are here today. We've also seen companies that choose not to come here because they mm. feel like we don't have a talent pipeline that meets their needs going forward. Um, so that's clearly a, a cry out to the education system. Um, it also is a cry out to other parts of the state, right? Um, Amazon didn't come not just about the talent, right? It was also right. about the roads, mm -hmm. you know, the, just the basic not having transportation for mm -hmm. people and things like that. Um, so I think our education system as a whole would like to be more reactive. I, I think that the uh, current legislative environment is very proscriptive, where uh, schools and teachers have so many rules about what they can do and how they must do it. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of room for being able to be innovative. So one of the challenges we have to do is one, make sure there's enough funding, and then two, give the schools and the administration and the teachers the ability to adapt as the, as the environment changes for workers, right? So when we know we need more high-tech people, how quickly can a university change? Not that fast. Mm -hmm. And a high school is even harder right now. I mean, the schools like Clarkson do a great job of adding new things as needed, right? Absolutely. Really doing everything they can to keep up. But it's hard when you have these other requirements that you must do. And it may sure. be kind of an archaic thing still. So mm -hmm. part of my job, part of our job in the legislature is to refine that, tune that, you know, try to fix that, make it a little bit better so that schools can be quicker on their feet. If I can plug one program here um, at the Clarkson High School um, and the junior high, I think, um, is the Construction Trades Program, which is fantastic. Like, it's only a few years old. Um, you know, those kids are getting great real world experience. And they actually built a storage um, shed for the library for us. It was just, it, it was a fantastic, you know, combination of our need, like, and their talents, and it was just great experience for those kids. So, like, I mean, kudos to Clarkson Schools for doing that, because those kids are going to get employed really quickly. That's fantastic. I'll tell you what, we get those solar panels on the it, roof. Yeah, they can Students install them. Students will be them. involved, absolutely. I, that would be great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so our next question comes from Lindsay, um, and she's also a student at the Clarkson Junior High, and she has a question about safety in public schools. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm from Clarkson Junior High. What is your stance on arming teachers with guns to protect students in life-threatening situations? Well, it just so happens when I was running for office uh, was right when that became a subject mm -hmm. of a big conversation in the news. We should arm teachers and some legislators and uh, different parts of government thought that was a good idea. I asked a lot of teachers if mm -hmm. they thought that was a good idea. Nobody ever thought that was a good idea. Every time I asked a teacher what they thought should be done to improve safety in schools, it was more about mental health supports and having counselors in the schools. It was never, sure. ever arming teachers. Okay. So. Fair enough. Um, our next question comes from Jacob, and uh, he's a, a student here at the Clarkson High School, and he has a question about your experience um, on a state legislative committee. Hello. My name is Jacob Levengood, and my question for you is, how have your experiences on the Environmental Quality Committee helped to shape your perspective of government? Actually, that's a great question or committee to ask about because uh, the Environmental Quality Committee, I am actually on both the Budget Committee mm -hmm. as well as on the Policy Committee. They're two different things. Okay. It's nice to have the opportunity to have both sides of that equation. Um, the policy side is where we actually look at things like what should the standards be for PFAS. And, mm -hmm. you know, we will go through the Department of Environmental Quality, we'll define some standards, mm -hmm. they'll propose things back, and then we are involved in the process through the policy side. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the budget piece is where you actually get to fund things and deciding whether or not uh, we can put money into the budget to put hydration stations in the schools, sure. right? Things like that, that comes out of the policy side. So um, the nice part about that is uh, in a time when government is very divided, you know, it's a lot in uh, Washington, but it's also happening in Michigan, this particular set of work, is we don't see a lot of division. Okay. We see a lot of working together and everybody's concerned about the quality of the water, everybody's concerned about the air and taking care of the lakes. And so we're actually getting good progress and working really well. So I would say 
really good experience on that one. Excellent. Yeah. So um, our last question is going to come from Kayla, and actually, it's actually related to this question because uh, it's um, in discussion about Great Lakes, um, and she's a student at the Clarkson High School. Hi, I'm Kaylin from Clarkson Junior High. What, is you, what do you think that we should do about our invasive species in our Great Lakes? Well, yeah, oh, boy. so I grew up on Lake St. Clair, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I, as, since I was a kid, that lake now is crystal clear. You can actually see the bottom from almost everywhere. And the reason is zebra mussels, mm -hmm. who are one of the earlier sure. invasive species problems that we have, we still have, because they clog up every pipe, they're, you know, they're horrible. Um, so, and it, they actually eat everything so that fish and other native species have a hard time finding food. The mm. mussels are getting all of it. It's a, it's a real problem. So we do have to do something more than what we're doing. We do have rules on the books for managing ballast. Um, we need to be tighter about that, uh, where they can release, what, has, what treatment they have to do to the ballast water before they release it. Um, and moving boats, because Michigan has so much water, right? We have lakes everywhere. So people will move their boats from this lake, mm -hmm. which might have a problem, Lake St. Clair, for example, take it out of Lake St. Clair, take it over to this inland lake, drop mm -hmm. stuff there. Oh, and then we're going to Lake Huron for a vacation, so we put our boat there. And so it's, you know, individuals with boats have the same problem, and it's mm -hmm. the washing the bottom of the hull, and you know, sure. it's work, it's it hard. Is, yeah. Not everybody knows they should do it. So I know we've been working to put signage up in all the boat launches, you know, did mm -hmm. you wash? And here's a wash right over here. And did, you know, just so a part of it is education um, and making sure that we keep the rules tight and do the best we can. We're worried about stuff coming in from uh, over in Chicago, right? The quagga and the you know things that are so we're constantly testing and you know really really paying a lot of attention and hoping we can catch things before it happens again. Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Senator. That's our last question. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to come and answer questions from students, and we hope you address. You enjoy the rest of your day here in Clarkston. Thank you. Our thanks to Senator Bayer for joining us today to answer questions from Clarkston area students. If you have a question for the Senator, please visit her website listed below or call her Lansing office at area code 517-373-2417. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time on Ask Your Representative where we'll talk to Republican State Representative Andrea Schroeder.